Hey there, I'm Corey Sanger with the Minnesota Robotics Institute, and I'm here to basically give an understanding of how machine learning can work with uh, neural networks in an intuitive and easy to learn way, and prove that it's not quite as hard as it seems. For this, we'll be using PyTorch and PyTorch Lightning, both of which make it so that you don't really actually have to learn any of the math with machine learning in order to actually make something that produces interesting results. To begin with, you'll want one of two things, either your own computer with a GPU, or you'll want a Google Colab account. If you don't have a GPU in your computer, or you don't know if you have a GPU in your computer, I recommend just going for the Colab account. It makes things a lot easier. And I'll be working under the assumption that you will be making a Google Colab account and following along with that. If you do decide to use your own computer, I recommend using something like JupyterLab. You can run your own Python scripts just using Idle or Visual Studio or PyCharm, but it makes things a lot easier if you have an environment that you can step-by-step -step perform things interactively. So let's jump in. Machine learning can mean a lot of different things, but in our case, we're basically going to be focusing on creating a sort of thing that can take in inputs and predict outputs. A good example of this would be something like if you showed a picture of a, a number, it would be able to predict, oh, okay, well, that is most likely a four. As we progress, things will be getting a lot more complicated. Uh, for example, the attention mechanism, it's going to have a little bit of weird terminology to it, uh, including things like uh, queries, keys, attention maps, but eventually that, the idea is that you don't have to worry about that. When we're done with this, you should be able to basically slot it into whatever you want and, and make it work for you. For today, though, we're just going to start out very basic. We're going to be using Linear and Relu from the NN package in PyTorch. Now, Linear is our first introduction to the concept of uh, features. Basically, the idea is that linear layers can transform X number of features into Y features. This is pretty powerful because it allows us to essentially interpret a set of numbers as a different set of numbers. For example, one of the output numbers could be specifically responsible for determining whether or not something is a 4 based off of certain pixel data. Um, however, for, again, our purposes, we don't actually want to get lost in the weeds here. What we want is just to know that we can turn a certain number of features into other features and then go from there. We can experiment as much as we want and find out exactly what makes these layers tick. On the other hand, we have Relu, which is a form of activation which the intended purpose is to introduce non-linearity to the model. You don't have to worry about what that means. All you need to worry about is the fact that you have an activation layer after each weight layer. With these two things, we'll be able to create our first networks, one that will predict numbers based off the MNIST dataset, which is just a set of numbers with labels. And then we'll have three other datasets that you can take a look at too. That'll be namely the line dataset, the circle dataset, and the dots dataset. What's important to immediately understand is that we're not trying to predict a value y given an x, instead we're trying to classify xy pairs. A good example of this is the circle dataset, where what we're really trying to do is we're getting a bunch of xy coordinates, and they're only ever labeled one if they are both a certain distance away from the origin. All right, so here we are in the actual uh, fun part where you get to do things. So this is the Google Colab notebook, and in here is where you will be doing most of your editing. So to begin with, you'll have a helper file here. You'll want to run this and then just run each cell sequentially. You do have some options in this cell. This is the one that you'll be editing. Uh, you don't need to set this to true, but you might wanna pay attention to, for example, the learning rate, the batch size, and the data set. So the data set can be anything from dots, line, circle, and menist, but we're gonna start out with the line. And then when you want to actually create your model, you'll be doing it here. So you'll see in a second, 
we'll go through some models. We'll try to figure out what the minimum model that we need is for each data set, and we'll try to challenge ourselves in that way. And then we'll take a look at how these models learn. Um, again, these things are just sequentially ran. This cell will give you some information on your uh, model if you have your GPU available, otherwise it'll just not bother. Um, so a good thing for this is when you see this, you hit File, Save a Copy and Drive, and you do that. And then once you have your copy, you go up to Edit, Notebook Settings, and switch over from None to GPU. Or if it's on GPU, you just leave it, because that is what you want. You want to use a GPU accelerator. You could use a TPU, but that would require you to set it up a little bit yourself. If you're a more advanced user, then feel free. Um, this is the training part. This is for me. We, again, don't have to worry about this. I will show you what this is. And this, oh, <laughs> found a quick little problem there. Let's save that. So this cell right here will help you visualize what you've done. So let's jump into my version, which is just Jupyter Lab. So up here, we can see we have the same exact thing. I have a hidden cell up here. It's the same thing as this helper file. When I run it, it will output my helper file. So then we don't need to do this because I have it already set up. So we'll import all of our requirements. We will set our things. So first of all, we're going to be using the lines data set. So copy, paste. We'll be wanting 10 epochs, three workers. These, you don't really have to worry about. Epochs is only important when you make deeper and deeper models. If you're using shallower models, 10 epochs is usually fine. Um, but as you go on, you'll want to measure how many epochs that you need in order to um, get the minimum loss. But you'll see how that works in just a second. Uh, the learning rate, you can either leave. This is huge, actually. This is quite large. But you, for the models that we'll be creating here, the learning rate here is probably fine. Uh, once you start making larger models, you could go all the way down to like 1e e negative 5. Um, and if you don't know scientific notation, this basically evaluates to you have 1 and you have uh, you have your, your decimal rather right there. And then you just move your decimal over. So 1, and then you move it over again and put a 0 in, 2. So 1e e negative 2. That's all it means. Your batch size in this will be actually one. You can increase this as much as you want uh, within the realms of your computer, but in Google Colab, you're probably gonna wanna set a, well, you could probably do 256 for um, dots, line, and circle. You'd probably even go higher. Uh, Minist is a little bit bigger. You might wanna set it down a little bit. You'll have to play around with it if you want. Otherwise, you can either keep it at one or at most, I would set it to 32. That should be probably um, fairly safe. So let's set our environment variables. So this, is, well, this will be what we're running with. Now for the model, we have a very basic model. I don't know what it says, four to two, it's two to two. <laughs> but um, so what we're doing is, right, we're using line. So we're taking a number of inputs turning into a number of outputs. If you remember how linear works, we're taking in two features, which is the X and Y coordinate of the line data set. And we're determining whether or not it's either uh, in our yes range or in our no range. And that will look kind of like this. So um, it'll be the opposite, really. It'll be, um, so if we have something that looks like this as our output value, that'll mean that it's not in the, uh, it shouldn't be a, like, shaded white. In this, it shouldn't be shaded, uh, or it should be shaded, uh, white. So, remember, black, white. That's all you need to know. Um, and, I mean, really, you don't even need to know that. You just need to play around with the guts. So we'll show you in just a second. If we have a model like this, 
This one's very, very, very basic. But we're just going to go with it. We're going to run it. So this initializes this linear model. It's a, Py uh, it's a yeah, PyTorch Lightning model with uh, all the sort of stuff that I've already put together for you. This You don't have to worry about this. Um, you may at some point have to worry about the forward. This right here at this entry point, you can see it labeled clearly here. This is what you want to change. So let's create our data module and our model. You don't really have to worry about this, but if you're curious, you can take a look inside our helper. So you can see the circle set, the line set, the dot set, and we can also see the data module and we can see the different visualization functions that we have here. Again, don't have to worry about it, but you might want to take a look at it to get an idea of what you're using. So let's run that. Let's get that going. And we should see a summary of our model. So you can see we have six parameters. We'll get into that in just a second, but that's kind of a sort of metric of our ability to learn. So right now we're at six. Remember that. So then we're just going to run that. It's not really necessary right now, but you'll see in a second. So let's run our training. And now we have to let it run. So this might take a little bit, might not take it along at all for you. It depends on your machine. Um, for me, it's going to go pretty quickly. But on Google Colab, it should go probably either the same or a little bit slower. It's a very basic data set to learn. So for now, we're not going to cut, but we will eventually be cutting out these uh, training sessions so that when we come back, it'll end up being like Epoch 9, I believe is the last one, this one right here. So you can see the bar will turn green, and now we're good. So we have trained our model, and it got to 0 0.485 as the loss, which is a metric of how well fitted the model is, meaning how well it learned. You'll find out that this value is way too high. And you'll see now when I hit this. So you can see this is a sample of our data set. And this is our model ran over what is essentially a sampling of all these different spots. You'll understand that a little bit better once we make a good model. I can tell you now that if you're seeing black, it means it's a very bad model and we really need to do better. Um, so here we come to a crossroads. We can either increase the depth or the width of our model. Um, or, or more accurately, really, we can't truly increase the width because we only have a single layer. So I guess that will be our first thing to fix. So let's go with four layers. And then, or four <laughs> neurons. And then we'll go uh, and just immediately have that work. And remember, when we have a, la a, a weight layer, what do we need to follow it with? An activation layer. Always, every time. You almost always do Raylu. Uh, eventually we'll be doing uh, other activation layers, but this is a very, very good basic activation. So let's save that and we'll run this again. So remember, we're running on the line data set. And then if we do this, we can see that our model has changed. So now we have 12 parameters up here and 10 down here. We have nearly quadrupled our parameters, meaning we should likely see that its capacity to learn has dramatically increased. And so let's find out if that's true. So we'll let that run because we're not going to be changing this just yet. And we can see some interesting stuff, but we'll take a look at that in a second. That's probably one of the more important things that we are looking at. But again, once we have real models that are learning, that's when this is going to come into play. Uh, and then if you want to find out how to use this, you can either search it up yourself, uh, how to make a weights and biases account, or Perhaps later on, I'll go over how to use it. 
but for now we're just going to use it for the videos. So let's train, and we will be back when this is trained. All right, here we are, um, all trained up and good to go. So let's run it again this time. Let's see if it worked. Any guesses? We have loss of 0.399, so it seems like we've learned something. Let's find out. Oh, uh, nope, unfortunately, once more, our ability to learn was not quite uh, at the level of a line. So it, it does seem like a very basic data set, but in fact, just learning off of what is essentially just coordinates to uh, a, a, like a yes or no sort of question, um, it's a lot harder than it seems. And to some extent, a lot of machine learning is just trying to figure out how to best frame a problem to be predictable. But uh, for now, we're not really going into the data science side of things. We just want to make models, right? So let's go crazy. Now, if you want to figure out how to make a good model that uses the minimum number of parameters to make the best predictions, you can do that. But for now, I'm going to show you how we can just make something that works no matter what. So let's add two more layers. So we're going deeper and we're only using two, uh, four neurons on each layer. So this is two to four. And in fact, let me just type that out. So let's, it's, it's good practice to kind of write out exactly how your model is changing the data. And so, we see this, so we're going from two features to four, four to four, four to four, and four to two. Um, you may be able to get by with less. Uh, you can definitely get by with more. You can usually be rest assured that if you load up on a, a just a ton of parameters, you will always be able to fit on the data. Um, but let's let's try to stay somewhat reasonable. So we're just adding the two layers for now. So let's run that. Let's create the data again. I'll put the model so you can see we've now, uh, I believe that is nearly tripled our parameters from last time. Again, this isn't an exact science uh, for, or not science, but rather a direct re uh, relation between the number of parameters and how well our model will do. You can train models that have fewer parameters that do better by using clever tricks, but we're kind of doing it the brute force linear method. So the only things we can really change are going to be the width of our model and the depth of our model. And again, remember, we increased the depth just now. So it should be able to learn more abstract information. So let's start up our weights and biases thing. We'll take a look at that in just a second. So again, you can see our run, how it worked. But now we'll see when we train and we'll be back. All right, so our model is done creating and you can see that the loss has significantly gone down. And you'll find that this isn't really linear with the, the parameters. Like I said, the ability to learn is not necessarily, or the ability rather to minimize the loss isn't necessarily directly uh, related to the parameters, maybe correlated. So let's look at our data set once more. Ah, that's more like it. See, we managed to predict a line. Now, it seems like we had to kind of go through a few things and try to figure things out just to predict something so simple, but this is kind of just the fun of uh, machine learning is just figuring out what you need and how to design a model that is able to do what you need it to do. Now, I did mention that I would show off this to you. So let's go. This is an, under weights and biases. So let's refresh. Ah, you see, I've been recording these every time. And you can see our value loss. So they all have the same name, but the bottom most one was our first. So you can see the orange line went down, 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 and it basically stopped learning after the fifth 
epoch. So remember, an epoch is just an iteration over the data set. After the fifth one, it didn't really seem to gain much. The same thing can be said about our, sing our second run when we added a singular extra layer. You can see that it kind of just, it, it learned, but it didn't learn a whole lot. It, it really does, it just looks like it started to lose the ability to learn at around maybe even 10, but it's just a line. But you can see that things have changed a lot when we added an extra two layers. So you can see we had a, some struggles and then we dramatically dropped down all the way down to 10 where we leveled off. So see, you know, with up to however many layers we have and with however many parameters we have, eh, about 10 epochs is good. But this is just a good visualization to let you see kind of how the loss goes down with each epoch. Um, along with just the normal loss, but you shouldn't look at normal loss. This is this won't tell you anything. This will tell you that you're over, overfitting to the training data. This will tell you whether or not you're actually fitting to, um, to real data. Of course, keep in mind, with the, the synthetic data sets that I gave you, the loss and the value loss shouldn't be too far off because they're really just pulling from the same data set. So now we've seen this. Let's play around with some other ones. And we'll just run through maybe dots and then Minist real quick. So let's put in dots. So we're going to be trying to train on dots. Now, this one's going to be a little bit harder, but we'll see. So you can see it's the same model, but now it's going to be learning on a different data set. So let's train this and we'll be right back. And we're back. And oh no, look at that. 0.377. Now it is kind of low. So you can take a guess now whether or not you think it'll have worked. And uh, first we'll take a look at the data set. So this is the dots. It's basically, oh, <laughs> a little screen peek down there. Um, it's basically different clusters of true areas. It looks like there's a couple down there. If we had more, you could see actual circles up here. So let's see how we learned. Ah, looks like it learned to classify these as yes, uh, this little area as yes, but nothing else. So we can take a look at this. And this is our most recent run. So you can see that under my data set for the dots, the uh, the dots down here is a little bit longer. I set that intentionally on mine. Um, let's take a quick look. Let's see if it's on yours. Um, good, it is. So you have to keep that in mind. In fact, we may want to do that for the circle one as well. So let's save that. So let's go back to this. Um, make the same changes here, just for the sake of uh, later things. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, let's just look at this, right? So you can see that the loss went up and down, up and down, up and down, meaning it tried to learn something, but it just didn't. So it looks like we're, lo we don't have the ability to learn. So let's, let's make some changes, right? Let's go a little bit wider. In fact, why don't we go all the way up to 16? Oh, remember, don't forget how this works. So this is a little bit more complicated, but it runs in the same, uh, runs in the same kind of situation. So eight, 16, 16 to eight, eight to two. So you can see how it kind of goes from two features to eight, next one, eight to 16, next one, 16 to eight, Next one, eight to two. It's pretty simple. Um, you should keep this in mind. This is so important for when you end up running into bugs where things just don't make sense and you're like, why is this not running? Why, why do I keep getting errors? So let's run that, get the data set going, and then we'll see when this is done if we manage to learn. So I'll see you in a second.
and we're back in and oh yeah looks like we just didn't get it so let's look at how we train yeah oh no it's all black and uh it did run but just to demonstrate yeah still black oh so we're gonna go up here this is a pretty big clue this tells us that we probably just don't have enough ability to learn more abstract concepts so let's do that and i will be back with the results all right and we're back and oh look at that the loss went down once we simply added a couple more layers we went a little bit deeper and then we we're able to learn better so let's take a look this time so this wasn't run yet but da 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 haha -ha, look at that we're able to get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these dots. Ha! And then a little bit of the um, the bottom bits, but those are less what I'm caring about. Um, these little patches here, that's pretty darn good. Um, and considering we did this with such a small model, I mean, okay, this might look big because you see, you know, nearly 900 parameters. But oftentimes when you're doing things with uh, bigger models, you might end up with like a million, 10 million, 100 million, depending on what you're doing, really. Um, if you're getting up to like oh, a million, you're probably either doing something weird or like state of the art, or you're probably over engineering the problem just a little bit. But um yeah, so this is this is a very small model, but it kind of goes to show just how powerful these things are. This isn't a whole lot of compute power being thrown at it, but it works. Oh, you can ignore that. Um, so yeah, let's look at the thing. So our most recent run was this one. And you can see it rose, 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 rose until it started to really learn something and that sharply declined. And it rose back up again a little bit, but then it went back down. So we can kind of guesstimate that probably around here is it when it learned how to do some very basic um concepts of just trying to get like the general uh regions of the dots figured out and then it tried to learn a little bit better about how to uh kind of get more of a granular approach to it and then it would have probably gone down even further if we let it train longer. So this is where epochs come in handy. You could probably run this for, um, I don't know, a few epochs, like um, 20, maybe even 30 epochs until it uh, started to stop being able to learn. But for now, that's fine. So we're going to move on to something a little bit harder. This is going to be the fun part. We're going to be using Minist. We are going to be predicting numbers. And you'll see that in a second. But for our model, we're going to have to use something a little bit more heavy duty. So let's try to pump up these numbers. Right, so 64, let's do 32, and 32 to 10. So remember to try to... Oh, I <laughs> didn't mean to do that. So I just know this number off the top of my head. This is how many uh, features that the Minist model has in its input layer. So in actuality, let's try to be a little bit smarter about this. So we're distilling 768 uh, down to 128. Let's go 128 to 128, 64, 64. And so we're kind of like basically bringing the numbers down slowly, slowly but surely. There's different um, things you can try. Uh, I very much want to encourage you to experiment with this. Try going a smaller than larger or a smaller model in general. Um, I get the feeling this is probably going to work. So let's try running this. So set it, Minist. Run that, run that. Let's take a look at our model real quick. So you can see our parameters, 100k. What did I say? The parameters get really, really high really fast. Uh, the linear layer itself is very inefficient. Um, as far as learning picture data, but you'll see another technique in, a, in the future. So 
again, for now, this is a very large model. We're going to have a better one uh, in the next video, I believe. I'm going to be doing this in the right uh, order that I'm thinking of. So let's just again run that. Open up a new uh, Weights and Biases logger. And then we'll be back when this is done training. All right, and we're back. You can see that our loss is actually fairly small. So let's try it out. Ready? It's going to be a little bit different. Oh, look at that. Okay. So this is our pictures. So seven, two, one, zero, four, one, four, nine. That's pretty easy for us as humans. But these are the predictions. So seven, two, one, zero, four, one, four, nine. It learned perfectly just in line with that low loss. And if you don't believe me that this is it actually learning, let me just show you real quick. So if we go up here, we're just going to cheat, right? So let's just create a brand new model. And now let's run it again. So remember, this is our how we manage to actually predict numbers. Let's run this again. And you can see this is random. So it's just predicting nine, nine for everything, every little thing. So you can see that our model actually learned how to determine what number a picture of a number was. And if that isn't the coolest thing that you've ever seen, I don't know what is. So let's look at the last run. Let's take a look at this. So this is our loss, remember. Um, wait, is this the... Okay, this looks a little bit different from what I was expecting, but um, basically you can see that it kind of, it seemed like it wasn't learning anything that produced visual results. And then uh, at the end there, it just kind of dropped, which seems like it, uh, that's kind of when it started to put all the pieces together and created the capacity to predict the numbers in a way that would allow for the, the loss to be um, significantly smaller for the validation. Um, and as a reminder, the validation is the kind of the test data set to make sure that we are able to predict correct testable things. There's a whole lot of things I can do in the future, but this video has gone on long enough and I want you to be able to experiment with machine learning, try to get a feel for it. Just play around with Linear and ReLU. Those are the only two layers that you need to worry about right now. See if you can run on the circle data set. See if you can run uh, something more efficient on the dots data set than I did. Or just go crazy and see if you, know, you can make the most perfect, accurate model with zero loss. Uh, the, it's, you can really just do anything you want with this. It's a, it's a fun little toy. So this is, this has been the demonstration of the linear and ReLU layers. And now you should have everything you need to play around with them and figure out how they work. Next time we'll be coming back with something a little bit more complicated. They'll be called convolutional layers and they make Minist a breeze. You do not need all these parameters to accurately predict Manist. So until next time, this has been Corey Sanger, and goodbye. <laughs>